which is the important part. So I just want to welcome everybody. I'm Mary Lou Rostilski, and I uh, want to welcome you to the second Zoom talk for 2021. Um, I'm, I'm on the board of the Yakima and Sela Neighbors Network. And as most of you know, uh, our goal is to make sure older adults in Yakima and Sela have support to stay in their homes as long as they can and as long as they want to. And uh, we advocate for the needs of older adults in the community and we try to develop programs that connect us, help us build new friendships and deepen them and offer services uh, in the scope of our volunteers. And we can't do that without the help of a lot of donors and sponsors, especially we wanna mention Triply Construction who's recently become a sponsor and a recent grant we got from the Yakima Valley Resilience and, uh, Res and Response Fund, which oh, is- collaboration between uh, the Yakima Valley Community Foundation, United Way of Central Washington, and the Latino Community Fund of Washington. So this afternoon, we are so pleased to have Sean Tate with us. He, we've already heard <laughs> that he has a lot to offer and we're gonna let him start. I'm gonna introduce him briefly in a minute, but Chrissy's gonna talk just a minute about logistics and then we'll get started on the program. Chrissy? Hi, thank you everybody for being here. I'm Chrissy Schott, Program Manager for Yakima Sela Neighbors Network. I'm so happy to see everybody here. Uh, we do have two of us on as hosts in case one of us uh, loses connection. So that's kind of a way to keep us all on. If you do lose connection, just go ahead and keep your meeting um, ID number and that passcode and that helps you get back on real quick and you can put those in. So if you've jotted those down, that's helpful. Um, we do ask that you mute yourself during the program just so our presenter doesn't get any feedback during the program. And we do always record, we ask our presenter ahead of time. So kind of plan that we record our programs for our website for future, if somebody missed the program or to go back and watch later. So if you don't want your image, you can turn off your um, stop video in the corner. You see a camera that says stop video and you can turn off your image there. Again, thank you for being here. And at the end later, I'll send a feedback email, an email with a link to our website that'll have a survey and then um, a link to the presentation video. Thank you. Great. Okay, well, let me just say a few words about Sean. Um, so people should mute their, mute their sound now. Um, Sean is the owner of Leaf on the Wind. Sean, is it arboriculture? Is that how you pronounce Indeed the word? It is. Okay, I've been practicing. Arboriculture, LLC, which is a, uh, I'm calling it a practice, Sean, uh, whose mission is to make trees healthy and beautiful. And Sean grew up in uh, Sila, and he's a certified arborist who has over 20 years of experience working in trees. He gave a talk on the intelligence of trees at the community college. Um, it was a collaborative effort between the, um, the Kawichikang Conservancy, a, a, a lecture series with the biology department at the college. And a number of us went, were very impressed and learned a great deal. And we were thrilled that he was willing to come and talk again about the intelligence of trees because it's, it's, it's a lot of new information and a, and a lot that's worth learning about. So we're very excited he agreed to come to, to this afternoon. Thank you, Sean. You're on. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Yeah. All right, so can everybody see that? We can. All right. Well, thanks to everybody for having me here. I really appreciate the opportunity to get to speak with you all. Um, I am doing this because I am I'm trying to change the world. I'm trying to change the way things work. And, uh, and part of the way that I do that is through my business and also also through speaking like this. So uh, today, I'm changing you guys. <laughs> but uh, I like to start with this image by Bev Doolittle because it really symbolizes what I love so much about this talk and this subject. But 
And you know how it goes. You're, uh, you're just a cowboy riding your horse down the stream, right? And you think you're all alone. It's just you and the horses out there. But the more you start to look, you start to see faces in the trees and the rocks and the stream even. Uh, turns out there's 13 of them, if you can. It's cool to see how many you can find. I never found all 13 myself. <laughs> But uh, this is, in a nutshell, what I want this to be like for you guys. I want you guys, next time you go through a walk in the forest, to have this very same experience, where at first maybe you think you're alone, and then the more and more you look around you, the more you start to see the faces looking back at you. So this is also what I'm going for here today. Uh, is this feeling. I want you all to experience what the kid in this picture is experiencing. It's a feeling that we've all felt before and, uh, and it's one which I just want to reconnect us all to. Um, but I want you to realize right now before we start that the, the feeling comes from a specific you know, realization that the world is just way more amazing and, and complicated and crazy than we could ever have imagined. So uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I kind of started in this business about a uh, little over 20 years ago. I started working for this guy in Bellingham uh, in 1999. I was going to Western and I was looking for a job to you know, get me through college. And uh, I was done working with the Forest Service. I was done fighting fires. And I wouldn't know it, but that would be the year that, uh, the first year that I quit and the year that uh, four members of my crew were killed in a fire. Uh, this was on the Natchez Ranger District. So I was pretty happy. Uh, I was getting paid money to climb trees and run a chainsaw, you know, uh, as probably is the case for a lot of 20 year old men. I just, uh, yeah, I just enjoyed the heck out of my job. These two pictures here were taken at about that time. Uh, in the picture on the left, you can see my foot and uh, looking down the tree, the ropes hanging down there. There's a little red speck uh, in the yard there, which is actually the helmet of a person who is currently taking the picture on the right. And so the picture on the right was taken at the same moment from the view of that speck down in the yard there. And I'm the climber up in the tree. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. But the more I did it, the more I began to realize this. Humans, and me in particular, <laughs> know so little about trees that it's laughable. I mean, it's, it's almost nothing. It may as well be. And uh, much of what I thought that I knew in the beginning of my career, much of what was taught to me has since then turned out to be really wrong. Not just wrong, but like the opposite of the way things really are. And so this this career for me over the last 20 years has been really fascinating because as I have, you know, just continually had experience with trees, I've learned more about how they work. Um, I kind of make the analogy here that it's a lot like cats. If any of you have ever heard anybody say that cats are pretty much all the same, you know, they all have the same personality and they're not really that different from each other. But if you've ever spent any time around cats, you know that's not true, you know, that they are all uniquely individual. And, and it's this case, it's the same way for trees, uh, because humans just don't have the patience to spend a lot of time around trees. But uh, luckily, I have been getting paid to. <laughs> and, uh, and so I've come across a lot of really interesting things that directly contradict much of what I thought I knew. Now, 
some of this is what I've come across in my own work. And then also a big part of this is kind of a synthesis. Uh, my presentation is a synthesis of the recent research on the subject. So there's been a lot of science in the last five to 10 years, which has come out on this subject that's just been revolutionary. I'm sure you guys have heard about it in, in other places too. It's starting to get more well known. But uh, one of the biggest things here is that plants have senses. Plants have really awesome senses. Uh, in fact, scientists disagree about how many senses trees have, but uh, they think it's somewhere between 17 and 23, whereas we have only five. We lack a lot of the language to describe their senses, like the way in which roots can grow underground toward a pocket of nutrients as if they knew ahead of time where it was, um, but without being able to see it or otherwise detect it. Anyway, in this picture here, you've got a simple pea vine, one which everybody's got experience with, and uh, in this case, it's growing onto an object and you can see how it grows towards the object. Well, uh, some sadistic scientists decided that they would do a test on these pea vines. And so they disentangled them from their supports and moved the support to the other side of the pea vine. And sure enough, the pea vine switched the direction that it was growing, moved everything over to the right and started growing that way. So then the scientists decided to get even more clever and they would put objects between the pea vine. Uh, and they tested to see if the pea vine could detect the location of the support, even through an opaque object, like a, a section of cardboard. And sure enough, they could. So then they started cutting shapes in the cardboard to see if the pea vine you know, could tell which was the best path to take. And sure enough, in many cases, the pea vine could. Uh, the pea vines could actually compare the distance of each possible route and choose the shortest route to the support through the convoluted pieces of cardboard. Uh, and this is a thing which we all have experience with in our lives, or most of us do. You know, this is a really common, common plant right here. We call this sense vision for lack of a better word, um, because it's the sensing of an object remotely, you know? Uh, trees in particular have a really great sense of hearing. So you know how dogs have a sense of hearing which is uh, quite a lot better than humans. It's on the order of a hundred to a thousand times better than humans. Trees have a sense of hearing which is a hundred to a thousand times better than dogs. And you think about what hearing is now, this is the ability of the object to sense when waves travel through the molecules of air around it. So the wave is initiated by some foreign object in its, in its environment, and the tree senses that noise wave, that sound wave, as it hits its foliage, because of course, all the leaves and needles and stems are these delicately arranged structures that tremble in the slightest little movement of air. And so we've been able to, we, I say we, not me, but scientists have been able to demonstrate that when you play the sound of caterpillars eating a tree, the tree will respond by secreting the compounds that the caterpillars don't like the taste of. Uh, just as if the caterpillar actually were in the tree. And they just played a tape recording. Uh, literally on cassette tapes. <laughs> um, there's also been a lot of science now to demonstrate that plants grow at pretty large increased rates. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood, you know, conservative estimates show 10% faster. Um, the, you know, other studies show somewhere around 20% faster, uh, but only when exposed to certain kinds of music. So that turns out to be mostly violin and reggae. <laughs> um, so the trees even have musical taste and it's not too bad. 
<laughs> uh, conversely, some kinds of music, like heavy metal, have been shown to slow down growth rates. Plants and trees in particular also have amazing senses of smell. Again, it's a one or two orders of magnitude better than the sense of smell in a dog. Uh, so think about what the sense of smell is first. That's going to be when a particle is emitted by another object and it floats around through the atmosphere until it lands on your body. And then your body analyzes chemically somehow that molecule that just attached onto you. And from that analysis, you learn things about what was emitting that particle. And uh, so trees are really good at this because they have one, a lot of surface area, and two, because it's all ionized ever so slightly. And so it captures uh, pretty much everything really well, uh, which also makes them terrific at capturing pollution, by the way. But uh, yeah, um, this is one of the ways in which we know that trees communicate. A tree will emit uh, a thing called a VOC, which is like a, a stands for volatile organic compound. And then when another tree receives that, it analyzes it and understands the message. It's a, a chemical message that the trees use to talk back and forth between each other. Um, we also use this word to describe their ability to detect nutrients underground, like I was mentioning before. Uh, I put the picture in here for the sake of irony. Uh, in this case, this is a uh, camper up at Camp Rogananda, where I was a, a, a worker for a long time there, leading groups of kids around in the trees. And it turns out that ponderosa pines, older than 85 years, will smell in the cracks of their bark like butterscotch or vanilla, at least in the mid to late summer. <laughs> So this is also another, uh, man, this was a shocker to realize. I, I was first taught that trees were competitive. I think probably all of us were taught that, you know, that, oh, if you got a dense stand of trees, and then, you know, if you cut some down, it's better for all the ones that remain. Well, it turns out that the trees can be connected to each other if they are of the same species. Um, so in this particular case, this is a road cut in Oregon. And uh, the trees have grown on a really steep slope where the soil has kind of gradually eroded. And, uh, and that's exposed to their root structure there. But they are big leaf maples. And so, yeah, this is just uh, this is a thing that trees do after they've been, you know, in a short distance of each other, like say, you know, less than a couple of hundred feet maybe, uh, for more than 20 or 30 years. So these two trees may have different DNA, but because they now have share a root system, they share a vascular system and they are a single organism with two different sets of DNA. Now, this is a thing which has been continuing to blow my mind, uh, is the ways in which trees can be connected indirectly now through a common fungal network. The uh, trees in the picture here are ponderosa pines, about an inch and a half tall, those little seedlings are. And so you can see that the majority of their root network consists not of themselves, but of this white fungus, uh, which is called mycorrhizae. And that white fungus is connected to the root system from the other tree. So mycorrhizae is a uh, you know, symbiont. It agrees to be a root system in exchange for sugar that the tree provides through photosynthesis. And that's what the trees do with about two thirds of the sugar they make is feed this huge root system underground. One of the things which just, in, there's so many facts about mycorrhizae that this is a subject of a whole entire presentation, a week of them. <laughs> but uh, one of the single things that has 
uh, amazed me is that in a teaspoon of soil, there can be up to two miles of these little white threads called hyphae. Yeah, so that's what makes the fungus such a good root system is that it has so much surface area to do these chemical interactions with. So this is to illustrate how in a forest that basically means that the whole tree, all the trees and the understory plants and everything is all connected together. They're all hooked up to this common fungal network. Now in the diagram here, you can kind of see there's some different kinds of fungus. There's the orange kind, and that's hooked up to some trees that look like maybe they're some, I don't know, maybe some uh, giant sequoias. And then there's also some red fungus that also goes on to the giant sequoias. And there's some purple fungus that also goes on to the giant sequoias. Um, but then I see there's some green fungus and the green fungus doesn't go to the giant sequoia. It only goes to, I don't know what that is. But you get the idea here. This means that when we are walking through a forest, you're not, you're not walking through a community of individuals. You're like inside the whale. This is a single giant, people now calling it a super organism that, uh, that is self-perpetuating, yeah. Uh, this is a subject which uh, there's been a lot of information coming out about lately and um, in which I as an arborist am currently trying to figure out ways to actually employ in my day-to-day -day work, which is mostly in the barge chestnut neighborhood in Yakima. And uh, what we now know is that trees communicate in both above ground and below ground. We know the most about the communication which is going on above ground. This is, uh, in this case, the left-hand side of the screen here showing the air dispersal of VOCs. We talked about this earlier. So trees emit a VOC in response to, and then there's a whole bunch of things here, including wounding herbivores, UV, uh, ozone, temperature, photosynthesis, light, and nutrient availability. Those are all things which we now know studies have been done and we say, yep, if we mess with this tree's nutrient availability, the tree will emit a particular VOC. It is gonna communicate what's happening to it, to all the trees around so that they all know. Um, yeah, so we know the most about that because it's the easiest to study. We are above ground creatures and that's where we do our work. But they're also communicating below ground. And this below ground, we think, is quite possibly constituting a lot more communication than what's happening above ground. But we don't know. Above ground, uh, a mature deciduous tree in the forest will emit somewhere around 50,000 to 60,000 chemical messages into the air per day. So they're extremely talkative. Uh, the studies now are basically just listening in on those conversations and trying to figure out what they're talking about. And uh, it's a chemical language. And, you know, we're pretty smart monkeys and we're figuring it out. And so uh, what do they talk about? Well, uh, they talk about all kinds of things. They talk about, um, you know, what the weather is like. They talk about uh, whether there is a, nu a nutrient deficiency in a certain location, or maybe whether there is a pathogen around. Uh, they talk to each other uh, also a lot about reproduction. I guess you would call it flirting, where you know trees will communicate with each other chemically and make propositions and anybody who wants to can agree to flower on the same day you know <laughs> uh, so it's really fascinating stuff to find out what they're communicating about but 
it's definitely not what I thought, you know, in the beginning when I was just having so much fun cutting them all down. So uh, here's a study that was done that was one of the first uh, to illustrate tree communication. And uh, one of the reasons, I guess, why this study is considered to be pretty well done and competent is because it was conducted by the, by the US Army, <laughs> of all things. But anyway, um, they were studying the movement of giraffes. And they found that in these one particular regions of Africa, the giraffes would have this pattern of feeding where they would eat, and it was always for a specific amount of time. Then they would stop feeding on these acacia trees, and then they would move, and always in the same direction. And then they would all stop moving after a precise distance and begin feeding again. And uh, the scientists were trying to figure out why this was so. And finally, they decided to start you know, they started to wonder if maybe the acacia trees were communicating with each other. And so they tested to see if that was happening. And sure enough, it was. The, what happens here is that uh, to begin with, uh, the, the, uh, the giraffe browses on the tree. And giraffes are capable here of eating like 250 to 300 pounds per day of tissue. So if they were to sit there for too long, they could definitely kill that whole entire acacia tree if it was within their reach. And uh, of course, with the long necks, that means that a lot of acacia trees are just within their reach. So the tree begins to secrete this, this tannin, which tastes horrible to the giraffe. And, uh, and then within a short period of time, the trees around that one that never got browsed also begin to produce tannins that make them taste horrible too. And so the giraffes know how far the message can travel through the air. Uh, they know in what direction the wind is blowing and being lazy, they just walk the shortest possible distance. And having done it probably uh, you know, millions of times, uh, they know exactly how far they got to go and in what direction. Um, yeah, fascinating instance of trees communicating with each other in order to avoid depredation by an herbivore. Trees also have a, kind of a, a unique parenting strategy. So they, they take care of their young, just like we do. Uh, a lot of a lot of people were taught, as I was in the beginning, that, you know, trees are kind of like, they just disperse their seeds and, you know, that's that. They're like fish. They just make a lot of seeds and then they don't take care of them. That the seeds are there on their own. And we always saw them as separated, isolated individuals. Well, that is definitely not true. Um, but the mature trees do hog up most of the sunlight. You know, that about 97% of the sunlight in the forest is taken up by the mature trees. And only 3% is left for the trees on the ground that are struggling to grow down there. And uh, what we thought was that those trees were just struggling, but it turns out that they were all hooked up to that common mycorrhizal fungal network. And through the network of fungus, the trees were sharing resources and keeping their offspring alive. And even in some cases to their own detriment, these big mature trees will sometimes not save enough for themselves. And they give as much as they possibly can to their offspring. And that is how and why their offspring survive. Were it not for this, they would not live on only 3% of the sunlight. So for me, this was kind of one of those like, yeah, no duh moments, you know? Like, I don't know what, what I was thinking before when I thought that, you know, they were all competing against each other because if they were, of course, none of the trees on the bottom could survive. Just as a kind of a cool little aside here real quick, this picture, in addition to demonstrating how trees hog up most of the sunlight on the surface there, it also 
illustrates this this cool thing called canopy shyness. All of these trees are being very polite. They're not growing into the space right next to them. Each one is holding back from its neighbors, creating essentially what's like a little miniature no man's land between them uh, so that they do not overwhelm their neighbors. This is because they're not competing with each other as we were all probably taught. Uh, it's, it's mind blowing, but you can look at it and see it happening. Is any one of those trees trying to overwhelm its neighbor? No, else the gap would not exist, would it? Since the gap exists, then none of those trees are acting competitively. So in this picture, we've got a beech forest. This uh, was from a study done in the UK. And here we've got a what, what we call a mother tree in the middle. And then a bunch of beech seedlings, probably mostly from its, um, its own seeds, you know, due to the way seed dispersal works. And uh, those trees are connected to each other through the common mycorrhizal network. And that's how this mother tree is keeping all of her babies alive. And I say her because beaches are dioecious. They have males and females, just like we do. Now, where we thought that the, the young trees there were struggling, what the scientists have been learning and what traditional wisdom has always known is that these trees grow much more slowly, but also much more strongly. Now, as a result of being raised in this manner with very slow growth, which rate of which is controlled by the parent, not by the, the child here. Uh, and when they grow slowly like this, they incorporate very little oxygen into their wood. And it's therefore much more dense and strong. And so this is why old growth wood was always so much better than wood that comes off of a managed plantation today. Uh, so when the trees live longer lives and are so much stronger, they experience fewer problems with maybe storm damage or you know wind or snow, that kind of thing. Um, this is really great for each individual. It leads to a higher quality of life. It's what every parent would wish for their, ch their child. Yeah, here's a close up of canopy shyness again. I love to watch this as I look, walk through the forest. Now, interestingly, uh, trees are unique enough individuals that there are a few competitive trees out there. And I don't mean whole entire species to talk about a species as if they were all the same is crazy, especially in trees. So again, I'll use the example of dogs. You know how you can have Schnauzers and Great Danes and they're in the same species. Technically, they could reproduce and have fertile offspring. Well, the amount of genetic variation between individuals in species of trees is an order of magnitude greater than it is in dogs. So uh, think about how rare it is in most animals to see an organism with a different number of limbs. <laughs> but we see this all the time in trees. It's so often that we don't even think it's weird. <laughs> and so uh, this is because trees exhibit this huge amount of genetic variation. And it turns out there are some, maybe it's because of their genetics, we don't know for sure, of course, but there are some that don't act in this manner like you see in the picture here that are not shy. They will try to hog up all the space and take over their neighbor's ground if they can. Um, and interestingly, those trees are shunned in the mycorrhizal fungal network. So, so here's what I began to see, okay? now. Imagine that you were a scientist studying animals back in the you know, 
the 1500s. When the current belief in our society and Western society was that animals didn't have feelings. And, uh, you know, when some people tried to insist that, of course, they did, uh, you know, look what happens when I kick it, you know, it, it acts like it's hurt. And they would, you know, say, well, you can't, you know, prove it that the animal cannot communicate that pain to us and therefore it's not happening. And now, of course, you know, we all just assume that that's kind of silliness. Of course, they can feel that pain. Well, I've been starting to have these kind of same uh, inklings about trees. And I use these two pictures because these show two pretty obvious examples. Uh, in the case of the ones on the left, the one on the left wants to touch the one on the right. Uh, people don't know this, or not all people do, but trees are able to move their limbs to put them where they want them to be. And uh, that tree is there because that's where it, that tree wants it to be. And uh, the two trees on the right no longer want to be touching. This is like divorce among trees. Uh, they used to touch, but the places where they used to touch have all died. See what I mean? Now, I don't know for sure that that's what's happening here because the tree can't communicate it to me. But, gosh, when you just keep seeing it over and over and over, after a while, you start to just act as if it were actually real. Uh, this is a really great example of learning behavior, which is happening in our valley all around us all the time. So trees have the ability to learn how to use water better. In this study, this is a really long study, which is actually still ongoing, it's a neat one. Uh, they started with uh, hundreds and hundreds of sample plots all over the world and mostly in the US, but uh, of different you know, biomes and different tree species and different environments. And then they waited for a drought to come along. And then after the drought came along, they started picking their, their sample groups and their control groups. And in this case, the control group was the group of trees that was in the valley bottom. And, uh, and then the uh, experimental group was the ones growing on a south facing slope. Now, the trees growing on the south facing slope, even though they were all the same species as the one in the valley bottom, they used water totally differently. They were much more frugal with their water. They did not transpire when it got above 87 degrees. They just shut down the stomata, those are the little holes in their tiny microscopic holes in their foliage, and uh, they just stopped losing water when it gets above 87 because they know that's a bad idea. Whereas the trees down in the valley bottom, it gets above 87, they just keep on transpiring water because they always got enough. They never run dry, but along comes the drought. And suddenly the ones down in the valley bottom start experiencing their first water shortage. And it turns out that who lives and who dies is determined by who figures out how to be frugal with their water. Now the experimental group up on the south facing slope, they experienced a very low rate of mortality um, because they were already being frugal with their water. To them, it was just still a drought, <laughs> you know, always had been. Uh, it was only the trees down in the valley bottom that really had to make a change to the way they were doing things in order to survive. And the ones that could not figure that out died. Uh, and so that's why in a drought, some live and some die. Now, interestingly, as the study goes on, these scientists are le learning that the offspring produced by these trees that know about being frugal with their water many of those offspring seem to also know that lesson. So uh, there appears to be a transmission of knowledge between generations that the offspring know how to be frugal with their water 
but not all of them. Uh, interestingly, there are always some members, some offspring that just can't learn that lesson. And if that doesn't sound familiar, I don't know what does, huh? <laughs> uh, this is another really cool example of learning behavior that, uh, that's a really neat experiment uh, that uh, a lot of people do in the classroom, for example, with kids. But the original experiment was done by this scientist who noticed that this plant, it's a little tropical herb, would close up its foliage whenever you touch it. And it does this pretty rapidly. I mean, this quick. It only takes a few seconds for those leaves to all lay down along the stem. And it, it's, a, it's a response to being browsed. So if it thinks that there is an herbivore around, it makes itself look like it's already been eaten. It makes itself look like the leaves have already been all stripped off. And so uh, in the after picture there, uh, that's not complete. They <laughs> actually do lay down almost completely parallel to the stem. And then after a few moments or minutes, uh, they re -back, reopen back up again, because of course, that's a much better position to do photosynthesis in. So the scientist decided to use drops of water for his experiment as the disturbance to the leaves because he knew that that would be a uniform surface. It would always have exactly the same mass and the same texture. It would hit with the same amount of force every time. And he taught this mimosa in fairly short order, just uh, about an hour and a half to stop closing up. It didn't have to close up anymore when it sensed the water touching it. But then he would touch it with another object, his pencil eraser, and it would close up. He would hit it with a drop of water and it would stay open. So it had learned to distinguish the difference between different kinds of touches. And this is a mimosa plant. These are not very complicated or sophisticated plants. As plants go, these plants are very simple. Yeah, uh, interestingly though, they were able to remember this lesson that they did not have to close up due to the water droplets up to a month later. Now the scientist was quick to point out here though that, um, that they may actually be able to remember this longer. It's just that the funding for his experiment ran out and so he stopped recording the data. <laughs> so, I mean, this is where, this is where our science is at, you know? It's just, it's incredible how little we know about this. Ah, yeah, trees have really cool examples of decision-making behavior. This was another really big earth-shaking moment for me. You know, I grew up in Sela where fruit trees were all around all the time. And the way that I was taught that trees all reproduce is that, you know, the, the pollen is emitted from some flowers and it lands on other flowers and pollinates them. And it's pretty much just random luck of the draw, the wind, you know? But I would like to point out here, there's something that should have occurred to us all along. If that were the case in the forest, trees would all be reproducing with their closest relatives, right? Who is most likely to be growing really close to them? Well, probably their parents or their uncle or their auntie or, you know, somebody probably from their direct family. And if you reproduce with the trees closest to you in the forest, you would inbreed yourself out of existence. But trees are the most successful organism on the planet. There are more of them than anything else. They exploit more resources than anything else. They have a bigger effect upon the environment than anything else. They are incredibly successful organisms. So they cannot be reproducing in the way that we always assumed they were, else they would not be so successful. So we're left with this conclusion. Trees can decide 
who they reproduce with. And in tests, we've been able to determine uh, in these tests done on these cherry trees here, which grow as volunteers all over the place in uh, Sila and Yakima, spread by birds like crazy. <laughs> and uh, anyway, in this case, this species can control who it reproduces with by, by executing a series of DNA analyses of the grain of pollen. So the grain of pollen from a male tree lands on a female's flower. And it's kind of like one of those games where you're trying to get the marble to go down this maze. Well, there's a maze inside the flower that the pollen grain has to travel through as the flower gets moved back and forth through the wind and through the tree moving its own branches and things like that. And uh, as it passes through the passageways, she conducts a DNA analysis on that pollen grain. First thing that she looks for is to see if that pollen grain is from a member of her close family. And if it is, then she causes the bottom of the flower to dry up and that kinks the passageway so that the pollen grain cannot complete its passage to the ovary. It's, uh, yeah. They also are able to uh, coordinate their flowering. So a female who uh, decides that she's gonna accept a male's proposal uh, will, you know, he essentially tells her what day he's gonna be flowering on. And if she likes him, she agrees to flower on that very same day. And so of course, in other cases, if she doesn't like him, she could refuse to flower on that same day. So this is a really neat example of trees making clear decisions. It does not happen according to random chance. And of course, why is this? You know, why would they be capable of making decisions? Why would they be capable of having senses? And why would they be capable of learning? And well, because it's highly advantageous because it makes you more adaptable and likely to survive, as in our own case. Here's a really controversial one, uh, which a lot of people just flat out don't believe. But when we talk about it happening in aspen trees, sometimes people can believe it. So uh, in this case, the uh, one in the picture there is a single aspen grove in Colorado. It's called Pando. And uh, it's thought to be the largest and also the oldest living organism on the planet. Uh, that whole, that whole, all the yellow in the picture there is one organism. It's a single DNA. It's, they're all growing from root shoots coming off of the same root system. And though a single stems may only live to be 75 or 100 years old, uh, the organism overall is tens to hundreds of thousands of years old. There's a lot of different studies that have been done to determine how old Pando is. And the ones that show the shortest ages are showing like 60 or 80,000 years old. And the ones that you know think it may be quite a bit older are saying upwards of a quarter million years old. Uh, but people have been able to track the movement of Pando. Pando used to be located in Alaska. Yeah. And before that, Pando was in southern Mexico. <laughs> uh, this tree ha has traveled over 24,000 miles in its lifetime. And that's just what we know of. Uh, it's more well-traveled than most humans. And uh, we know, studies have shown, for example, now that uh, this tree, this organism, this one plant is capable of growing its roots over seven miles in a single year. Seven miles is the distance its roots can travel in one year. So this is all incredible. Um, this organism, this species here, is the most successful tree species on the planet, capable of growing in a wider range of 
habitats and environments than any other tree species. You'll find them all the way up at like Camp Muir at 10,000 feet, all the way down to sea level. And you find them all the way from the Brooks Range to Mexico. They grow in the jungle. And uh, yeah, it turns out that they have all been able to do that, at least in North America, without the benefit of sexual reproduction. Since the last ice age, there have been no females in North America. There have only been a handful of males that survived. And they have sprung, spread and grown to become the most successful tree species on the continent. Uh, in the whole world. And in 2008, some uh, tree activists decided to introduce females to North America. They brought them over from Europe and planted them on the East Coast. And uh, as of 2019, which is the most recent data that I've seen, they had already, between 2008 and 2019, they had spread to Ohio. So soon, in a few years, we will begin to see aspen trees reproduce in our area much more successfully than they ever have been able to before, which is saying something. So that's going to be really cool to see. We're all going to get to probably see that. It's going to be happening in the next two or three, maybe up to five years. So this is the point where everybody who maybe used to be a forester or ever went to college <laughs> is like, wait a second, no, <laughs> I don't think so. This is not what I was taught. This is totally contradicting everything. You know, don't we thin the forest, for example, in order to produce faster growing tree stands? Well, yeah, that is exactly how we have been doing it. And that has been the assumption, but it just, it just never got tested. The science never got done until just now. And now we're finding out that the trees that are left after a thinning operation actually grow more slowly, not more quickly as a result of the thinning. So it's, uh, yeah, the forest grows much better when it's incredibly dense. Um, this also has a big effect in my world because pruning. You know, geez, when I first started, we always isolated trees from each other. We carefully prune one so that it stayed away from another, and they had a little bit of separation between them. But man, we've been harming them that whole time. <laughs> they grow better when the stand is denser because they're not competing with each other. So if they're not competing and they're cooperating, why? Why would they be cooperating, you know? Well, here's a whole bunch of reasons. Man, and this is just, you know, what I was able to fit onto a, a PowerPoint slide here. There's, there's 10 times as many reasons, you know, but for example, what we know now is that if there's a forest covering the valley, then the stream flowing out of that valley will flow all year round. If you cut down all the trees in that valley, the stream becomes seasonal. It doesn't flow in the summertime when there's no rain. Why? I thought the trees were all competing with each other. Why would they be releasing water in the summertime? And why would they absorb it all the rest of the year and then release it to keep that stream going? The only thing that changed was the presence of the trees in those studies. Those studies showed that the rainfall levels stayed exactly the same. The seasonal patterns stayed exactly the same. Nothing changed except that trees used to be there and now weren't. And that caused the stream to become seasonal. So uh, why would the trees be releasing water in the summertime when they're not getting any water, when it's not raining? Well, because doing so creates a whole bunch of benefits, you know, to have close neighbors means they're not going to get broken off by the wind. They're not going to get sun scald. They'll be more likely to get warned about a pest or a pathogen coming along. You know, they'll also maybe get a help from their neighbors if they come on hard times. And they're more likely to find somebody to reproduce with. 
um, they live longer, happier lives. They're just healthier when there's more of them. So this is what I'm trying to change. Uh, I think that uh, the reason why our society and maybe just particularly Yakima hasn't got this message yet is because of the fruit tree industry around here where topping trees is common. But I'd like to point out that in fruit trees, and in the case of fruit trees, the reason why they are topped is not because it's good for the tree. It's quite horrible for the tree. Um, it's just to keep the fruit within pickable range of a ladder. And as a result of being topped, it makes the tree become sick and, you know, dangerous. If it survives for very long at all, the regrowth sprouts become likely to break off. There's huge injuries, you know, where decay is going to spread right at those where the regrowth sprouts come from. Um, yeah, I think that the reason why this message hasn't really spread in our community so far is because people have been focusing on the fact that it's bad for the trees. So it's like, yeah, you're creating a dangerous tree. You're creating a sick tree. Well, that is true, but it's not the heart of the matter here. This is a moral and ethical issue too. And that's the reason we should not be topping trees is because it's awful, you know? Uh, this is like a form of brutality that, that's, uh, is is morally wrong. There is this famous philosopher who says you can judge the heart of a man by how he treats animals. Uh, he was ridiculed for this belief, but he honestly did believe that animals just simply could feel pain. Uh, Immanuel Kant was a philosopher from the 1800s. And it's really interesting to, to point out here that this is merely a, a continuation of this trend which has been happening for a long time. It used to be that the only organisms in our society that had any protectable rights were males who were also white, who were also landowners and of a certain class. Uh, and over time, the circle of organisms that we include to have protectable rights has gradually been enlarged uh, to include all humans and, and even animals. Uh, and, and I'm arguing now for trees as well. And I think that if we were to do this, that this would also solve another big problem uh, related to uh, global climate change. Uh, I think that trees are probably going to be a big part of the solution, whatever has to happen here. And an ethical and a moral respect for those trees is going to be a big step in that direction. So uh, we've got, I hope, enough time for a few questions. Uh, would anybody like to start if you want to unmute your uh, computers one at a time or two at a time, feel free. Any questions? Sean, can you uh, end your screen sharing and so people can pop up? There oh, we go. Sure. Great, good. Oh, yeah, great, great. <clears throat> Sean, I have a question. Um, my family has a tree, uh, a tree farm, which is basically just a woods in central Pennsylvania. And over the years has been advised by the forestry school at Penn State about care of these woods. We're not trying to grow trees in any way. We're just trying to take care of the woods. Is there any kind of cutting that is important to do if you're taking care of woods or is leaving it totally alone what you should be doing? It depends on what your goal is. Uh -huh. So. If the goal is to restore the quality of the habitat, you know, mm -hmm. for example, to increase the fertility of the soil back to levels where it used to be. Usually, if the land has been logged off, soil fertility takes a quite a drastic decline. And, uh, 
you know, if you were going to try to restore the land, even in just that one manner, then you would be doing it differently than if you were trying to, for example, manage this for the sake of nearby properties who are commercially harvesting timber and who want you to do certain things with your land so that you know they can turn a profit on their land. Um, you know, for example, you might uh, <clears throat> you might plant certain species, you know, along your edges or or thin, you know, as is typically advised. Uh, but there's different kinds of plans for different kinds of purposes. Okay. So, okay. yeah, if you were trying to, you know, create a, like a restoration of the land, then you would begin by importing and bringing back in as many of the native species as you can and gradually eradicating the non natives and also trying to increase the density. The natural forest is almost always quite a bit more dense than what people think. Uh, it also usually has to have a lot more dead and rotting logs on the forest floor than what people like to see in their own land. <laughs> Having taken care of hundreds or perhaps thousands of woodlots, you know, in the uh, Whatcom County region, when I lived over there, I saw that what most people wanted was a pretty cleaned up appearance. They really liked it much better that way. It felt better to them. And, and that's because of the kind of organism that we are and the kind of habitat that we feel most comfortable in is when it's a little bit more park-like and open. Uh, we like to be able to see quite well so that then we can tell if there's any predators coming, you know? Um, but we also like to be wrapped up, you know, with trees tucked right up against our houses uh, with a nice good long view from there. But the protection of trees where we sleep uh, with a view of our surroundings through them. Mm -hmm. And that's a thing which we just find psychologically comforting and which is horribly damaging to the forest. So yeah, it's a- That's it's helpful, difficult. yeah. That's helpful yeah. to give me some my ways of thinking about it. That's great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? Uh, what, would you, what would you, can you recommend, uh, you know, some, some trees, uh, yard type trees that would be, uh, you know, sort of ideal for the, for the Acoma area? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, I'm a really big fan of the honey locust which is already quite popular, but that's a really strong hardwood and it's a really fast growing tree. Um, and it's pretty much immune to all the pathogens that we have in this area. It's just a great choice. Uh, I also really like red oak. It's another really strong hardwood, fast growing tree, uh, immune to pathogens in this area. Uh, and I'm also particularly fond of beech trees, spelled B-E-E-C-H, just like you saw in you know, the pictures of in the presentation there. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, those are all kind of the three that I just, when I get a job to go work in one of those, I know it's going to be a good day, you know. Uh, those are sort of the, the golden retrievers of, of trees. They're mm -hmm. just so good. They just want you to be happy and they will try to make you happy, you know? Uh, they rarely misbehave. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Any others? Well, if anybody does have more questions, uh, feel free if you would like to make my email address available. If anybody wants to take it down right now, they can. Uh, my, uh, my email is leaf on the wind <laughs> LLC at Gmail. And, uh, yeah, if anybody thinks of a question that you'd like to ask later on, uh, that's how I usually do it. Two minutes after I hang up is when I come up with my questions. Just feel free to email them to me. I sent them your um, website, which is very similar to your email correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, that's Leaf so. on the Wind LLC.com. And so. I see that you're on Facebook as well, which had some fun. I was kind of looking through that while you were talking too. So that was a good, if anybody else oh, wants cool. to get on Facebook, there's some videos and some good stuff there. Um, we had a question. Somebody was wondering if there, I don't know if you give away, you had some great il illustration and do you happen to give your PowerPoints uh, away or, or share your PowerPoint with people sure. or so if anybody oh, wanted yeah. that, you would maybe, okay. Absolutely. Send me an email and I'll reply to it with the attached PowerPoint. Okay. Great. Yeah. So Susan, if you heard that, so Susan is asking, okay. Yeah. I'm gonna put those up on my website. I just haven't gotten around to it because it's ski season. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, any last questions? It's been a long day and a good day. And John, you contributed a lot to that. Thank you so yeah. much. This has been yeah. really Thank Yay. you all for Yay. the opportunity yeah. to speak. Thank you so much. And, uh, it's been a pleasure. Excellent. Let me just tell people that two more Zoom talks coming up on February 3rd. Um, we've got Colin Fogarty, who is the executive director of the Confluence Project. The Confluence Project is the history, living cultures, and ecology of the Columbia River. It's a fascinating uh, project that Maya Lin was, is the sculptor to do six sites along the Columbia. And he's gonna be talking to us about the Confluence Project. And on February 24th, we've got uh, Heidi Shaw from the from Yakima Valley College talking about chimpanzees and sign language and making science accessible to all students. So that's coming up on the 24th of February. So uh, it's going to be hard to top tonight, but we're going to keep learning. So that'll be great. Thank you, Sean, so much. Thank you. All right. Take care, Thanks, everybody. everybody. Sign offing. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks. Go hug a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Don't top it. Yeah. All right. Thank you.